Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to join you at the start of ACL 2021 and share a few words. First and foremost, I hope you and your families are all well. This past year has been very difficult for all of us. It has had tremendous implications on all our personal lives. Some of us have lost close ones. Many of us have been affected in how we conducted our lives. This includes childcare, interactions with family and friends, the already brittle work-life balance, and just in general, the way we conducted or not our daily activities. This past year has also had implications on pretty much everything we do in our professional lives. From the way we conducted our research and interacted with our mentors or mentees or collaborators, to the way we took or instructed our classes, the way we worked on our papers, and obviously the way we have been running our conferences. So I want to take a moment and just acknowledge the difficult year we have all been through and give a little praise to those near us and most of all to our own selves for being so strong to make it through. What I want to do today is to give you first a glimpse into what the ACL exec has been up to recently and also my view of what the ACL membership has been up to and importantly what I believe the ACL membership should be up to. So what has the ACL exec been up to? Um, as you know, this is a group of people who have been working hard on various aspects that have to do with the functioning of the ACL. It also includes non-executive officers who have been working equally hard to contribute to the ACL mission. I want to highlight three main initiatives that I have personally been devoting a lot of time to. And these are, first, the addition of a new role within the ACL. Now we have established this position of ACL Equity Director, um, which is currently occupied by Natalie Schluter. And the goal of this is to focus on a number of issues related to diversity and inclusion, from childcare to financial support and more. Uh, there are various initiatives. We are working toward a safer and more inclusive environment. And as you know, they are already, these are already permanent positions within the organization of our conferences devoted to diversity and inclusion. Natalie is also working on ACLX. The goal of this is to increase the reach of our conferences. We have uh, several areas of the world, including Latin America, East Europe, parts of Africa who are not represented as much as they should in our membership. And the goal of ACLX is to organize events that are similar in spirit to ACL um, in a way that facilitates the participations of people from around the world. So basically increase uh, the equity of our events. We have also very recently established an ACL ethics committee, which has the goal to provide a continuous and consistent platform for dealing with potential ethical concerns raised within ACL events, provide guidance and address consideration of what constitutes ethical research. This committee will coordinate with the ethics co-chairs at our conferences um, to ensure consistency of process and provide guidelines across different events. Finally, the last initiative that I want to highlight is the ACL year round mentorship, um, which is work that I have been doing uh, together with Mohit Bansal, Vinod Prabhakaran, Jing Jin, Ash Kazemi, and Lisa Bauer. Um, the goal is to provide mentorship opportunities for students starting in the field by complementing the mentorship sessions already happening at our, at our conferences through mentorship meetings that happen throughout the year with mentors from academia or industry, addressing topics ranging from how to choose a research topic, how to write a paper, all the way to should I do a PhD and how do you keep a work-life balance? If you are interested in being either a mentor or a mentee, you can sign up at the link that I'm showing on this slide. So now what has the ACL membership been up to? Of course, this is something that you and I know best as people working on research. Um, in this field. But I want to provide my 
own view of what we've been up to and what we should be up to. So first off, who is this membership? With many thanks to Priscilla, I'm showing here a chart with the number of members. And as you can see, we have been growing very rapidly. We currently have a little over 6,000 members, which is three times more than the number of members we had just seven years ago. Now, who are these members? Um, I took a look at the number of students we have, and currently half of the members are students. Percentage-wise, it has been a significant increase compared to last to 2019, so prior to the COVID pandemic. And that is because of the virtual format of our conferences. So this is something to keep in mind as we plan our future conferences. Keeping a virtual component will help with the reach of our events. Now we have been working on a number of new areas, a lot of exciting directions, many um, applications of NLP in real world. What I believe are some of the areas that have been receiving a lot more attention in recent years are dialogue, which includes natural language generation, also analysis of conversations and the use of applications in practice, language and vision, um, which is exciting because it implies interactions with our colleagues from computer vision. Similarly, computational social science has um, grown tremendously in recent years. And again, it implies interdisciplinary collaborations with researchers from social sciences. We have also seen um, growth in work on knowledge bases and common sense knowledge bases, which includes construction, use, creation of such knowledge bases. And there is also more work in ethics in, um, in NLP, um, including work on, on bias, trustworthiness, privacy, and, and more. Now, we cannot ignore the elephant in the room, and that is the use of neural networks for natural language processing. Um, neural networks are currently permitting pretty much any area in, in NLP. Um, and that's again, an area that has been receiving a lot of attention over the past um, five to 10 years. I had the curiosity to look at how work on neural network has grown on one particular aspect of NLP, which is that of creating word representations. So I looked at the number of papers that have been published over the past few years which have referred to word embeddings. Um, and you can see a tremendous growth. Um, just last year, 2020, we had 25,000 papers that referred to word embeddings. Um, again, a sharp increase over the past just few years. Now, I'm not a big fan of word clouds, uh, but still here I am with a word cloud. I took titles of papers referring to word embeddings just to see what are these papers about. And here is what I got. Um, they are covering pretty much any area in NLP from semantic analysis to work on corpora, word similarity, cross-lingual classifications, bilingual work, machine translation, sentiment analysis, and so much more. So pretty much all the areas within NLP are making use a way or another of, of neural networks. Now, one thing that we have been doing um, is to focus primarily on system performance, on system accuracy. And we see this in the papers we write, um, in the reviews we write and the reviews we, we receive. By and large, we are a community that values systems accuracy at the cost of pretty much everything else. So what I want to do here is to make a call to all of you to stop chasing accuracy numbers and realize there is more to natural language processing than state-of-the-art results. So if we were to go back, I want to make an analogy and just look at where we were, say, 30, 40 years ago. We have started by working on different components of natural language processing, sometime in isolation, for instance, working on part of speech tagging or word sentence abbreviation or measuring word similarity and more. And we are focusing on this separate parts of NLP and trying to make advances on those. Now, over time, we made a lot of progress. There was there were significant improvements that we've seen. And also we started putting these pieces together. And with even more work, we got to an even better place where we made even more progress. And 
we are currently in a position where some of the problems in NLP are considered solved. For instance, if we take part of speech tagging on curated English, uh, we get very high um, accuracy numbers. Uh, if we look at certain classification tasks, certain language models, and so on. Now, one way to look at this is to say, okay, now we have um, we have a lot of progress and we are moving toward an even better, better place. Another way to look at it is to realize that this is just one facet of a bigger problem. Um, and in fact, I believe that's where we are today. We have made a lot of progress and really polish and advance things in terms of system performance, uh, but we haven't really paid attention with, to several other aspects which are equally important. And I will highlight now a few of these aspects. Um, one of them, a facet that I believe we should focus on is interpretability of our systems. And just to illustrate what I mean by that, um, here is a word and I want you to think of what is that comes to mind when you see this word. And of course, different people would get different concepts coming to mind. Uh, but really by seeing this word, we can think of something. There are certain word associations that form in our mind. The same goes if we look at this prompt, there will be certain word associations uh, that will form in our mind. Now, if I show you this, um, probably there isn't really much you think about, um, at least not something that would be similar to the associations I was pointing to earlier. Um, at the most, you will think of word embeddings because I just mentioned them. Uh, but really with this kind of vectors, there isn't really much that we can interpret um, by uh, about how our systems work. So the question that we should be asking and some of us have been asking already is what are we really learning from neural networks? And there is quite a bit of work happening already, um, including the series of workshops on black box NLP. Um, there is also research on building interpretable and explainable models, or even to generate explanations. Uh, but there is room for more. We need to have systems that are more transparent, most easily understood by their users. Um, we also need to collaborate with researchers in other fields, for instance, human computer interactions to understand what kind of explanations or interpretations are actually useful and when. Another facet of the bigger problem is generalizability. Um, and this is something that we need to have across domains. Currently, the networks that we train on one domain do not transfer well to other domains. It's also difficult to get started on domains that have little data. And there is, of course, the bigger question of what does in-domain really mean? Is it the same topic, same style, same level of formality? Um, we should also be focusing more on generalizability across languages. There are 7,000 languages um, spoken worldwide, not counting dialects, but then data sets and methods are available for just a handful of languages. I really believe that focusing on high resource languages um, creates false optimism about the problems we have actually solved. And there is so much more that we need to do to make progress on the languages spoken worldwide. So what can we do? Um, I'm including here a pointer to an excellent blog post by Sebastian Ruder, um, who's pointing to several ideas of how can, we can all contribute to making computational linguistics available for many languages. This include constructing data sets in more than one language, running evaluations on multiple languages, um, or working on research on languages with scarce resources. Another facet is that of ethics. Um, and there are already conversations happening in our community on what constitutes ethical research. There is work taking place on addressing how to detect bias um, in word representations, how to create trustworthy systems and more. There are important questions such as what is an ethical NLP system? And also I believe very difficult questions that we'll have to address on how to define ethical policies that align with the values of all our members. We are a global society and we include members with different sets of beliefs, different sets of values. And so defining such ethical policies will be a challenge that we'll have to address. As I mentioned earlier, there is already 
um, an ACL code of ethics adopted from the ACM code of ethics. Um, we have conference ethic chairs at pretty much all our conferences. And we are also establishing an ACL ethics committee. Um, and we encourage everyone to contribute to these conversations. Another facet is that of implications on NLP on social good. Together with my student, Ji Jin Jin, we um, ran recently a survey um, asking questions about uh, social impact of NLP. One question we ask is how aware is the community of the social aspect impact of NLP? And it seems that about half of the people who responded to our survey so far, so these are just initial results, are thinking about the social impact of NLP. Uh, but there is also a fair number of people who are not necessarily considered this, um, considering these implications. We also ask um, the question on potential of NLP to contribute to social good in the long run. And generally we see optimism. Um, more than 75% of the people consider that there are at least some social problems where NLP can have um, can have an impact, but there are also people who are concerned and consider even the possibility that the NLP positive impact will be outweighed by its negative impact. Among current topics that have been highlighted by respondents to um, our survey, um, topics that have currently social that, that are currently being worked on and have social impact are machine translation, especially low resource machine translation. Also assistive technologies, for instance, text-to-speech, uh, gathering and processing of information, including natural language understanding, information retrieval, question answering, summarization, work on NLP for mental health or detecting hate speech, um, also work on combating the spread of misinformation and, and more. Among negative impact, I'm quoting from an anonymous, anonymous respondent, NLP's major negative impact now is putting more money in less hands. So that's something that we should keep in mind. Unless we change our focus on system performance, we are moving very quickly toward a monopoly. If you want to voice your opinion, um, here is a link to our survey, which is ongoing. Um, there will be a birds of a feather organized tomorrow at um, 17 UTC. And you can also contribute more on this website. Finally, the last facet that I want to address is that of environmental and financial cost. You are probably familiar with this uh, paper by Emma Strubel and colleagues, um, including here two snapshots showing the um, carbon dioxide um, impact of training models, for instance, an NLP pipeline or a transformer, and also the financial impact of various um, systems, for instance, BERT for creating word representations or a um, transformer for natural language generation. So here, the big question to ask is who can afford to run these models? And as I just mentioned, uh, I believe we are really facing the danger of a monopoly. Um, just a handful of companies will afford to run these models if we continue to only value accuracy while ignoring costs. If you want to contribute to this conversation, I encourage you to join the Green NLP panel that will take place during the business meeting um, tomorrow, so August 3rd at 14 UTC. So with that, um, I want to go back to my analogy to the Rubik's Cube. I believe this is where we are and it will take a lot of work to start solving the other facets. Um, and while doing that, we'll probably also get to a place where we'll be losing some of the accuracy um, while solving some of the interpretability, generalizability, ethics and more. My main message to you, my main call to you, it's let's stop chasing accuracy numbers. We should also focus on interpretability, generalizability, ethics, social good impact, reduce environmental and financial cost. And last but not least, I believe we should also focus on diversity and 
equal opportunity. I am doing this recording in my home country of Romania. I grew up here in the 70s and 80s in, by today's standards, poverty condition. When I was in college, I love math and I love languages, but I spoke very little English. I had no idea what research even meant, and I did not know what was the role of graduate school. And yet here I am, 30 years later, speaking to you as president of the ACL. I'm just one out of many who are now making contributions to our community. And that's just because at some point in the past, there was someone who lended them a hand, gave them a piece of advice, or just generally helped them pursue a path that they didn't even know it existed. So be that person today at this ACL and hand a, lend a hand to a newcomer, help them find out about the joy of doing research in this field, and then over the years, watch them grow into the future researchers who will shape our field. So let us all work together toward this perfect place where we'll be solving not only system accuracy, uh, but also all these aspects which are critically important. With that, I want to conclude by thanking the conference organizers for all their tremendous work. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the conference. <laughs>